Welcome everybody to Plays Well with Others. Hi, my name is Michael Malcolm Bjorklund. I am the District 2 Director at the Florist Classic Press Association and a Director at Large for JEA. As you notice on the top side, it says, please fill out a personality survey upon entering. Well, that's not really happening today. However, it is crucial that you fill out the survey of the link on the link that I provided, you can either download it, write it down on a piece of paper, you'll want to get your four digit code. Um, there are four digit numbers that come attached with this program, with the session. So um, before you move on, it is crucial that you do that because the first part of this is predicated on the fact that you know what you are. So play well is with Plays Well with Others was a session that I had done for about three, four years in a row. And I had stopped about two years ago just because I wanted to try different sessions. Um, however, in these strange times that we live in, obviously we're not in Orlando, I wanted to give it another shot for people who had not had a chance to um, see this session play out before over the years. So let's get started. So as you can see, I am from Jacksonville. I teach at Columbia High School, which is in Lake City, Florida, and the north side just off of I-70, um, off I-10 and I-75. And I have two boys, they're a little bit older now, and um, I teach journalism, yearbook, and TV production. So what do we need to know to start? So if you've not taken a test like this, this is the Myers-Briggs test. Your advisors over the years might have given you a color test where you're using Pantone or you're just using different colors to sort of indicate mood and emotion and where you stand with creativity. And the Myers-Briggs test is something very similar. And you might have completed a Myers-Briggs test over the years. Um, they're supposed to be scientific in the sense that they shouldn't your four digits that you get shouldn't change. However, I've taken this plenty of times over the years and noticed some, not inconsistencies, um, but just minor changes. So the purpose of the Myers-Briggs test indicator is to make the theory of psychological types understandable and useful in people's lives. Again, the test measures what it says it does in validity and produces the same results when given more than once. So here are the diagnosis of journalism types, all right? So first off, let's look at some of the data. And when we're looking at the data, we're looking at the numbers from the, the people that took the test to the people nationally and here in Florida. So when you looked at your four numbers, okay? Um, when you took yours and you got done and you flipped the page over, and you're like, okay, these are my four. So the ISFJ, okay, were about 5% um, five, five and they were the most popular. In fact, if you look at the ISFJ and you're one of those, um, it was 5% of the study sample. However, for the national study, 17.91% were ISFJs. 30% of the Florida participants were the same. And then you go through an ESFJ were 12%, Florida 12, ISTJ was 10%, ENTJ 1%, and ENFP was 5%, right? And you can see the most popular is introverted. And we can go through all of these in terms of what they mean in a few minutes. So let's start taking a look at more of what they mean. Um, so E, um, we know stands for extrovert, I stands for introvert. Um, hopefully you obviously know what that means. You're extroverted, you're more outgoing, introverted, more internally. You have S would be more feeling of, uh, of sense. Um, S is for sense, F is for feeling, and J is for judging, all right? And we can see where people stood with regards to both, okay? so. Um, you can see a total on the one in the left column, you can see a total of E's and I's, which are the one of the other choices. You have S and N, um, and they've broken it down um, between total population, females and males, um, T and F, and then J and P. And so you can look at those numbers and see where do they stand in terms of um, total population, and then broke down by both men and women. 
Um, so if you're a reporter right now, a reporter, if you have one of these three numbers or three sets, ENTJ, ENFP, or ENTP, you are the reporter type. And I've illustrated this by Krusty the Clown. And uh, the reporter um, basically are strategic. They're organized and possess natural leadership qualities. They're master coordinators and effective give direction to groups. They understand complicated organizational um, situations and quick to develop intellectual uh, intellect situations. They're outspoken. They're able to, um, they're outspoken in a sense that they can put their plans in place for improvement and they're decisive. Their key characteristics are extrovert, intuitive, thinking and judging. I put Mr. Burns in here for the editor right now. We're looking at the editor here, the people that are behind the scenes. Um, technically, if you're a reporter, you have editors that are in charge of you. It could be your sports editor, your photo editor, it could be your editor in chief. These are people that manage the group. And when we look at them, they're obviously more analytical. Okay, these are also people that are a little bit more determined to push themselves. And that makes sense, right? Um, however, some editors can be a little bit more reserved, which you find it'll be a little bit different in that sense that you'd think a, an editor would be somebody more outgoing. However, they um, overall, they tend to want to lead in the background uh, versus being in the forefront, right? And I've had plenty of editors in the newspaper world myself where the editors um, were not the ones the most outspoken. They liked to lead, but they didn't want to be in front of the camera. They didn't want to be the one on the front lines, right? They liked what they did behind their glass uh, tower. Okay, they expect perfection from themselves as well from others and are comfortable with leadership so long as they are competent. Okay, makes that completely makes sense for editors. A key characteristics are introvert, intuitive thinking and judging. Then you have the creative type that these are the photographers, right? So the photographers are naturally um, more creative. Um, however, they're a little bit more introverted. Um, they're, they don't mind being behind the lens versus being in front of the lens. And you probably have some photography people that are like that where they love taking pictures, but they don't need to be on the other side of the lens. In fact, some of them just don't want to. Um, but they're driven by their values and seek peace. They're empathetic and compassionate. And they want to help others and humanity as a whole. They're imaginative, artistic, and have a talent for language and writing. Okay, makes complete sense. Again, these are INFPs or ISFPs. The anchors. Now, the anchors are going to be sitting people who sort of like that attention, right? So if you're an anchor, ENFP or ENTP, they're introspective, but they're very social and they like to express themselves, right? So when we're looking at the anchors, they want that attention. They want to feel that importance going along with them. So this can even be from the TV side, um, obviously, or people might be doing vlogs or anything of those, that nature itself. Um, and it says to bring attention to what they feel is important as often as they do with ethics and current events. I put this on there for myself because I wanted to see, and especially if we have any advisors with us today, the teacher falls into ENFJs, okay? These are people who are looking for the, the humanitarian type of roles. They want to implement their vision, right? So this is when we look at what a teacher does. A teacher is there to drive their implement, what a vision um, of how to get better, how to improve, how to learn, things like that. And they're the catalyst for human growth because they see that potential in other people with their charisma and, you know, and they're focusing on values and vision and they're passionate about the possibilities of people and improving them. And so the teacher falls into the ENFJs. Now, this is a point where I would typically ask people to raise their hand to tell me if they um, fit into any of the others. And it's usually scattered. So I'm not going to tell you right now when I do this that everybody's going to raise their hand. In fact, you might be in one of these other fours. So I'm going to have you take a look at the fours, the, um, the ISTJs, the INTPs, the ASFPs and the ISTPs, and you can see what they are, and maybe you fit into them.
So I'm going to um, introduce you to a former coworker, Lauren Trout. She works for patch.com. We do have some patches um, in the state of Florida, more on the West Coast near, I believe there might be some near Tampa. If you're over in that road, you might have a patch. Patch is uh, headquartered out in New York City. They were once owned by America Online way, way back in the day. They are no longer owned by AOL, but they are community-based um, grassroots journalism. So it's all town-based. You basically, with patch.com, you're going to get hyper-local, um, hyper-community-based journalism versus big picture. They're going to be focusing on you and your community. And they're great entry points for journalists if you're looking for a career in journalism and there is a patch in your area this is a great place to start you're going to get a lot of experience from learning photography learning how to work your beat learning how to make connections and lauren trout is one of the big people now um, nationally with regards to hiring and she lives in illinois and she in this clip she talks to you about how important it is to get to know different people let's hope this works The best thing you can do is to recognize each other's strengths and weaknesses and play off of them to better your publication or news website. For instance, at Patch, we have reporters who flourish reporting from the scene of a breaking news story. However, they don't do so while well staying even tempered with commenters or social media fans at home. So we send them where they belong. We put them in the field. We enable them to provide us with live updates back home where an editor is manning the social media sites and also serving as a hub of information for readers and commenters alike. That way readers get the best of both worlds. They get thorough, live, breaking updates from the scene of a story coupled with an interactive, engaging exchange with an editor back home. Good luck. First with Lauren, way back, way, way back in the day, it was probably like 2006, 2007, 2008, I was her designer. She was the editor of a, a small publication called the Frankfurt Station, and her and I worked together, and after we left and I went over to the Chicago Sun-Times, she took over and started working at patch.com, and from that point, we've been good friends, and um, she hires a lot of people, usually rough, roughly about five to 10 each month, and she has to go through that hiring process. So it's important to, to see um, the different types of people and how they can connect. And, and then how do we play well with others, which is the biggest key, no matter if you're in the newsroom, um, right? If you're in your school's newspaper or if you're in your school's yearbook or even TV production, these are the types of people you're probably gonna find. So my goal here is to give you some tips and tricks to work with different types of people. I put this one a few years ago, this was after 2016 election, but it, I think it fits well now just as it did then. And basically it's talked about the opposition, right? It said, many ways the election divided us, right? They, it, with vastly different candidates representing vastly different people, we have a notion, we have as a nation, we have to come together united to heal these wounds, but how do we do that? How do we work with people who are on the left? And how do we per work with people who are on the right who don't share the same philosophical views with us, right? Now you think in a lot of ways, in some of your towns, you work with people or you people in your classroom are share that same mentality, but not everybody does. Maybe your parents don't um, share in that same uh, philosophical, um, political viewpoints that you might share. And so what do we really want to do? How do I want to play well with the other side? And the first thing you can do is get to know that other side. Now, it's, it's very narrow-minded for a person to sit there and say, guess what? Um, you don't believe what I do, so you're wrong and I'm right. More importantly, we need to do as a, as a country and as a group to say, okay, well, let's look at your side and let's look at my side and let's really get inside each other's heads in terms of what were you thinking and why are you thinking that? What is the rationale? And you want the other side to know that you're listening to them because that's very important to understand that the other side feels their voice is just as important as yours. So you, and it is, both sides are equal in terms of what they could be thinking. Um, and you should let that other side be heard. Um, Long-term success with this person requires immediate patience. Yes, be patient. The other side is not going to think what you think. So patience is important. Don't go off the ledge to make comments to them. Um, show empathy to open to their your ideas and show compassion, right? We're all people here together, um, especially nowadays um, with everything that's happening in the world. It's important that we show compassion no matter 
if you're a Republican, Democrat, independent, where you stand in the aisle, right? Because we're all people dealing with this together. And don't come in hot and lower your defenses. This makes the most sense because if you automatically look at somebody and say, and want to come in screaming and yelling, it's probably not the best thing to do. Every classroom that I've had over the years and many, many newsrooms that I've been a part of over the years, there is also somebody who is the gossiper, right? These are people that it doesn't take much explanation to know what the gossiper is, gossiper is. This is a person that likes to talk, right? They love to have that information. And, and you know, I was just watching a good episode of The Office when Michael Scott decided to be the gossiper and, and share the information because he wanted to be that person that everybody goes to and has that information and something to share. So what are some of the strategies when I work with a gossiper? What should you do? Well, first off, tell the person directly what that impact they have on you. Be honest and say, listen, I, I don't appreciate this. We, you know, that this has an immediate impact when you share my information with other people. There are real things here involved. So Please be open when you talk about how their behavior is impacting your life. Number two, which makes complete sense, stay out of their conversations, avoid sharing details. If they don't know anything about you, they can't share it. If they make it up, that's a completely different story. So most importantly, when it comes to people who like to gossip, don't share your information, and don't get into that conversation. It is super easy to leave a conversation. You don't have to be a part of it because if you're sitting at that person and they're sharing that information, the gossiper wants that attention. Don't give it to them. Don't be part of that group. Last, let go of the idea that the gossip within the office can be controlled and focus on your own behavior. It can get out of control pretty quick. So it is important for you, if you're especially in your group, there's somebody who likes to gossip, don't engage and you can't control it. So just don't engage and walk away because once you find that nobody's paying attention to the person who likes to gossip, it's gonna stop. The control freak, whether that could be your advisor, it could be um, an editor, it could be a reporter, it could be anybody, literally anybody who just wants to have the ultimate control over there. They like to nitpick. They like to sort of be, in, or at least if not in charge of everything, have a part in everything, right? And they need to feel that control of everything around them. It, it makes them feel good. It makes them feel important as they're a part. However, with a control freak, you have to be extremely careful. And these are some strategies to work with if you are working with a control freak. First off, Give them praise. I know this is going to sound weird, but control freaks need to feel like they're being validated for what they do. So first off, give them praise and for their what they're doing, okay? Give them praise for it. Number two, let go of control at times of things that aren't important. If it's not super important, give it to them. If it makes them feel even better and you don't need that extra stress, let them handle tasks that aren't going to affect you, all right? And this is important too, because if they might want that control, and you might be just fighting over something because, well, just because. You might not have a reason for why, you, you know, that's happening. So again, give it to them. It's easy, it's less stress on you. Now, from there, don't take it personally when they need control. It's important. Don't take it personally when they are in need of control because it's really not about you. It's not, okay? The victim. I find a lot of people like to play the victim card. The, oh, woe is me. It's always happening to me. Um... They feel like everything's happening around them and they're always the victim. They're never in charge of their own situation. So the victim is the constant complainer and likes to draw people to their own problems or problems that they perceive to be there, okay? Um, when things go wrong on a team project, when they were left out in important conversations, these are all important situations because the victim will play the part of feeling like it's never their fault, 
right? They're always the victim. And so some things you can work with when you're talking about victims is number one, try to exercise patience. Mm -hmm. You're going to hear that a lot from me, that patience is super critical um, when dealing with some of these um, different type of personalities. So express exercise patience with them during conversations and recognize that they believe that they've been victimized. Number two, try to point out evidence to the contrary when they begin complaining. Again, if they're beginning to complain, show them how what they're doing isn't, they're not a victim. Show them how everything's falling in line and that might help the person feel better. Lastly, maintain your own boundaries during conversations. Be very mindful that the victim will be looking to, they're not looking at your angle, they're gonna be looking at them, at why they're being victimized. And you can get sucked into it, right? So maintaining your own boundaries. They might wanna try saying how we're a group and look at us being victimized. And then that just starts getting out of hand. So maintain your own boundaries during um, these conversations. Paranoid people, people who are always scared, people who are always nervous, people who just, for whatever reason, whether warranted or not, are just the sky is falling, right? All the time, the sky is falling. And sometimes the people who are paranoid, it's kind of fun to just watch them freak out all the time. However, this can be problematic because it can be shown in negative ways when you have people who are always paranoid because you're trying to consistently talk them off, off the ledge in ways. So some strategies that work with people that are paranoid. Exercise what you say to them because in their mind, in their mind, those words can be interpreted in several different ways. The same can be said if you're trying to email them or text them. As we know, tone doesn't do well in text. What you say if your words aren't specifically written in ways that they can understand or they're automatically going to get, let's be honest, you might make them more nervous. You might receive another text and another text and another phone call and another phone call right after that because they're paranoid. So please be careful on how your words are going to be interpreted. Number two, offer fact-based and rational information to them. Don't try going, well, this may happen, that may happen. While I heard that this might, those things that we know when we're trying to spread rumors or things that we may know just because we think we're being helpful might not be helpful so much to people, right? So offer things that are facts to people. And don't get caught up because they're, uh, they're nervous, they're paranoid. It's not your job to change their perspective. It doesn't fall on your world, okay? That's not your job. Your job is to offer fact-based situations to them. The next group is the passive-aggressive ones, right? These are the people that sort of kind of phony. They're like, oh, thank you so much. And you're like, oh, did they say thank you? Did they mean it? No, passive-aggressively, just, you know, trying to sort of coddle you a little bit. So they're hiding their true feelings by pretending everything's okay, when in their mind, they're really upset, right? And some people play the passive-aggressive card better than others. Some people don't do a good job of hiding their true feelings. And so they may have a, high, a tendency to appear cool, calm, calm and collected. However, that's not what's going on inside of their heads. So how do we work with the people that are passive aggressive, right? People, these people like, well, first off, don't do the same to them. If they give you a passive aggressive comment, don't go back and give them their own passive aggressive comment back and forth, right? And you want to confront these problems out in the open. Don't hide them or don't talk to other people about them, really confront them out in the open when they're being passive aggressive. You'll want to understand some of it, but you'll want to do it in a way that's through direct communication, right? Because their negative behaviors might stem off of being able to share this with other people. And by using that direct communication, it can give you a greater impact on what your message is to them and why they're acting the way they're acting. And lastly, as we've seen several points before, express interest in who they are and in their feelings and create a safe space for them to talk to you. 
because if they don't feel like they're going to be talked to or validated, let's be just perfectly clear here. These are people that are passive aggressive. They don't feel like their voice is heard. So talk to them um, and, and really feel, make them feel like what they're saying has value. Flyers. Um, these are the people who can go from zero to a hundred in a matter of mere seconds. Um, this is like, everything's perfect. Everything's perfect in your, in your newsroom, in your, in your classroom, you're doing a spread, you're doing a story, no matter what, everything's going well. And the next thing you know, the phone rings or somebody else walks in or you hear some news that could be considered a little bit tough. Um, but they like to fly off the handle. These are those drama queens and drama kings, and they sort of emotionally overreact to something, right? And this is the, oh, you know, uh, now, now think of all the things we're going to have to do, and they, they fly off the handle, and you're like, this just happened. We haven't had time to process. We haven't had time to think about the steps in place that are going to make this a better situation for anybody, right? So... When types like this feel like their needs are not getting met, they fly off to handles and they become very angry or dramatic. And we've always, or we've always known what we, the drama kings and drama kings, what they're going to do. We know their personalities. So the first thing you can do with them is try to use praise for the value they bring to the office. Okay. So think about the things that they do, those values that they do. Number two, communicate how their behavior affects you and how you are impacted by their mood swings. And lastly, remain calm when they fly off the handle and try to calm them down. Most importantly, calm them down. Because by them being calm, it brings the whole newsroom together, the whole classroom together. But when they're flying off the handle, yeah. It's a completely different room. It's very, extremely different classroom. We all know these people, right? These are the grumpy gusses. These are the people who, no matter if you bring them donuts, bring them coffee, um, if everything's perfect, you might have the perfect spread, the perfect story. Everything in the world is perfect. It's blue skies. Everybody's awesome. Everybody's great. But to these people, they're grumpy. They're just cranky. And when they're cranky, it's exhausting for everybody to deal with somebody who's always grumpy. And they crush your morale. The classroom morale is going to be crushed by people who are just routinely negative nallies, right? They're, they're the grumpy donkey namesake or the Eeyores, okay? And they're doomed to failure. And suggestions are just new opportunities for defeat. Nothing's ever going to go right. And for these people, you'll want to provide constructive suggestions, right? If they're not, if they're complaining about something, say, well, we can solve that by you. want to give them logical, fact-based information that's going to say, okay, if this was going wrong, how can we solve that? How can we fix it? And often ways there's ways to fix why they're so grumpy. Now they just might just complain to complain. However, by them sort of taking, by taking some of that away, you might find some of your morale and maybe they'll even recognize like, oh, right. Because you want to confront them in private because grumpy gusses are going to take this more emotionally, right? But you're going to want to talk to them in private. Um, and so they might not even realize they complain so much. I've known people over the years like, really? I, I'm a complainer? I didn't know that. I never even thought I was a person that liked to complain. Obviously, some people just don't know. They might not think that they're complaining too much, and realistically, they are. And so it's good in private, in private, not in the open, to talk to them about how they are acting and how they're sort of bringing everybody down. And like I said, it might, they might not even know it. These are the egomaniacs. These are people that the egomaniacs just love attention, right? They, um, they, they, it is really all on them. They always know what is best and they ignore even in the nicest advice or suggestions. Um, in fact, they consider themselves lucky that if you work, have the opportunity to work with them, right? These might be your, your superstar players in your rooms that have just a little bit too much. They might have been given a little bit too much and they have an ego about themselves. They, they really feel good about themselves. <sighs> Tips for working with an egomaniac. First off, an egomaniac and another egomaniac 
don't go together too well. So check your own ego at the door. Have a head to head with them is usually not the worth of time and energy. An egomaniac is an egomaniac. Be assertive. Don't let the bully win. Big thing with working with egomaniacs is they are the bullies in the sense of they want to feel like they are in control of everything. Lastly, distance yourself. Deal with them in small amounts and then walk away. You don't have to spend all day with them. Small amounts with egomaniacs. Walk away, live your life. You don't have to be part of their world all the time. And probably for your own sanity, you're not. Um, there is a YouTube link here that is placed. I am not going to um, show you the video for interest of this is a computer based. This is Ron White. He teaches um, at Oak Ridge High School um, in Orlando. And Ron White's a super nice guy. He's a journalism advisor. He is a newspaper advisor. And he consistently deals with different types of adversities. And he is super creative in terms of trying to get the most for his students. He is one of those advisors that cares deeply about his um, students and does different things to make sure that his students, uh, he's maximizing their learning and getting the most out of him. So if you know Ron White, you know that he is a caring um, man and that he really cares deeply for his students and will do anything for him. So if you have a chance to listen about what Ron White suggests you can do for your staff, go ahead and watch it. Um, let's see if I, I don't know if I put this in as a screen, Nope, it is a screen grab, but I wanna give you a last story about uh, Dennis Jacob. I worked with Dennis 20 years ago, back in the early 2000s, and he had worked for a paper called the Stewart News. It was part of Treasure Coast newspapers, Stewart, Port St. Lucie, Fort Pierce, um, Vero Beach, and he was there forever. He's a long, 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 long time sports guy, and he in fact just retired just a few years ago. And the building he's in right now is no longer the Stuart News. They've um, closed the building down. I think the school now owns it. It's the, the, uh, Martin County owns the building now, and they, they're running it. But the thing, bigger thing about Dennis is that he let people, because he's so hardworking, he, you know, it, he sort of doesn't sort of not assertive in some way. So there was once when I was there, a design editor, and she didn't even know his name and he felt terrible. It was like, she'd go to him, hey, you. And like, there was no personality con connection there. And Dennis just would always get so upset because he never felt like his work was being validated. Remember, if you, if you have somebody that you work with who's been there forever, you might have um, a senior in your class and you're a sophomore and you're like, and, th and that student doesn't feel like her, her uh, voice is being heard. It, the worst you can do for to somebody is not appreciate them for what they bring to the table. And Dennis never felt like that. And the leaders above him, the editors never made him feel like he was worth anything. And it's always important when you're talking with playing well with others is, yeah, we're dealing with the drama queens and kings and we're dealing with people who fly off the handles, but we're all people. And most importantly, the biggest thing I could tell you in your terms of playing well with others is know the people you're working with have those chances to come talk together, right? Have your ch chances where maybe every Monday you're bringing food and you're just having food and drinks, or maybe um, you're, you know, you're doing things and you're having round table discussions, or maybe you're having, you know, weekly meetings or monthly meetings with on a one-on-one -on -one basis with students to get a sort of wellness check to see how people are doing. It's super important to know where everybody is in terms of their emotional well-being and if they feel like they're appreciated and if making sure that the work that they're doing falls in line and, and it's just good to talk, right? And it's good to have those bonding moments. We talk about how important it is to have those classroom activities in the beginning of the year, but there's no reason why you can't do those classroom activities in the middle of the year. There's no reason why you can't have them at the end of the year. Um, our big task and our biggest, biggest challenge as a group is to sort of have this family approach. Yeah, guess what? It's gonna, things are gonna happen. People are gonna fight. We, we know this. These things happen. However, 
it doesn't have to be like that. We all know we're individuals. We all have these um, individual things that we believe in that make us who we are. However, it's also super important to know how can we make it better for each other? Well, it's about all the time I have. I'm gonna, I'm sending you, um, there's my email address at the Columbia K-12. There's the MW Bjorkle if you need to find me other types of media. Obviously, I haven't played this in about a year, year and a half. It says Chicago, which means that we're pushed back a little bit. I didn't uh, do this for JEA, I guess, but I haven't done it for FSPA for two years. So if you have any questions for me, please find me. Again, I'm Michael Malcolm Bjorklund. I am the District 2 di Director at FSPA. And please, if you have questions about your staff, individual si situations that you want to talk to me, that you can't talk to your advisor, that I can help you with, please send me a message, we can talk. Um, I also have additional forms that I can send you or things that have worked for me. I can suggest some good books. Otherwise, I'm hoping you have a great rest of your week.